Science Headliners. Please welcome our host from Linda Hall Library, Vice President for Public Programs, Eric Ward. During his distinguished career, Fred Hayes has been a military fighter pilot, test pilot, astronaut, aerospace executive, and now author. Never Panic Early, an Apollo 13 astronaut's journey was released by Smithsonian Press in April this past year. Mr. Hayes, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. I'm happy to, happy to be aboard. The phrase that you use for the title, Never Panic Early, has been a recurring theme, maybe unfortunately for you, you know, during your aviation and astronaut career. What does that mean for you? What does it mean, never panic early? How would you define that? Well, never panic early uh, or represent uh, situations you face and uh, events and, and normal life. Uh, I, you know, I, obviously I spoke to the ones in the book uh, based on my uh, flying and space career orientation primarily. But the, uh, I had one, uh, since I've written the book, I was uh, riding an in Interstate 10 at night uh, with a granddaughter and uh, she suffered a grand mal seizure in the, on the trip. And, uh, and I'm going 70 miles an hour down the road and you, and you have to make decisions. Should I pull over and uh, wait, then wait for an ambulance? But I decided to just keep the pedal to the floor and got to the next exit to find out the nearest medical facility to get her to uh, myself uh, with the aid of a sheriff I had arranged through 911. And so it's one of these things where those things happen, you have to uh, surmise your situation and look at the uh, possibilities and, and what you might do, uh, just for a few moments at least, to assess and don't do anything too quickly that might be the wrong thing to do. So that's uh, the, the basis of Never Panic Early and it fits, uh, uh, every, unfortunately, everybody I think uh, has some of those during their lifetime. That's true. I, I hope she's doing well now. And yeah, she is. Yes. Okay, good. Where does that come from, that, that ability to uh, remain calm in a, a stressful si situation? Does, uh, I'm, I'm sure you uh, gained some of that through your pilot training, but are, are people bored with that ability? Well, no, I think, I think the, uh, the probably the strongest basis impregnated in my mind was what was learned and uh, through my training and experience in flying airplanes initially, because uh, no matter who you fly long enough, you're going to have something happen in the airplane that you have to deal with. Uh, and so it was those years, I'll call it years of those uh, experiences in airplanes, not, not uh, every day, but often enough you, you went through that. So it's kind of ingrained that you should know uh, an airplane, of course, you know your systems very well, and you're able to surmise from interpreting the instrument readings or having your wingman look in case I had a fire, fire warning light on one time to, to check everything that I wasn't on fire uh, before I jumped out. But uh, you have those uh, circumstances that you learn to uh, don't just immediately uh, uh, do the, the, wrong, the wrong thing in essence, but uh, check it out and then surmise and analyze the situation to take action. Probably your most well-known never panic early moment was about 56 hours into your Apollo 13 flight when you were, you were three quarters of the way to the moon or, or close to it. What was your initial reaction when the explosion of the oxygen tank in the command and service module happened. When I listened to the, the mission control, the flight director's loop and the air to ground loop, everybody seemed really calm. It, 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 if you didn't know there was an accident, you would think it was just a normal routine conversation. So what was going through your mind at that uh, moment? The moment of the, uh, the bang that we heard that reverberated through the metal hulls uh, was really not a never panic early moment. Uh, it was a surprise, uh, you know, something was wrong. Uh, we didn't know what was wrong. So it's more, I said it's more confusion. And immediately when I got from the lunar module where I was doing a TV show, we just finished it. Uh, and I got back into my normal position in the capsule, the command module and looked at the instrument panel. 
uh, it was clear we had lost one of two oxygen tanks, tank two, and we had, we had a second tank that looked intact. So it really was not life-threatening. Uh, if that tank, but unfortunately, slowly it showed a leak, a slow leak. And uh, so then it, then it slowly grew into one of these never panic earlies, but it was a controlled uh, set of uh, looking at what we can do to stop the leak with mission control and taking steps to do that. Very, first of all, they carefully, didn't, again, didn't want to do something that would be irreversible. But that took, that took over an hour. So we wrestled with about an hour before we got to a point where it, we knew we couldn't stop the leak. So that's when Jim and I were dispatched to go power up the lunar module, the second spacecraft that we were going to use to land on the moon and, uh, and get it powered up so we could, uh, we could live off of it. Uh, my, my emotion, my biggest emotion uh, immediately when I realized we'd lost that second tank was sick to my stomach with disappointment. I knew we had lost the landing. I knew we weren't even going to go into lunar orbit. But I thought, you know, the second tank looked good. So I said, you know, otherwise we're, uh, we're okay. We'll keep everything powered up, but just have to abort. And then your return flight back to Earth required you to do a lot of procedures that had never been tested before, e even in simulation. You had to power down the command module. You mentioned powering up the lunar module, but uh, you, you write about how you know a lot of these, a lot of the things you were doing uh, hadn't been tested before. You couldn't do star alignments, for example. Where did uh, where did the confidence come that yeah we can get through this? We can make all of this work. Well, it, this uh, the, the steps you're talking about uh, and. Uh, that were invented, if you will, to uh, get us back, were not all at, done at once. It was sequential over the next uh, several days, actually, uh, that uh, there was an open item list that uh, Gene Krantz had got aside out of mission control with a brain trust he formed to figure out what, what major items were going to have to be figured out, and people were dispatched to go work the problem and solve them. But they were, I, I was confident because I'd seen the way we operated in the system we had for handling problems. Every mission had problems, some uh, more serious than others. Ours probably the worst for the, all the workarounds. But Apollo uh, 14 and Apollo 16 almost didn't land. Both of them had problems in a, a lunar orbit that precluded their landing that required workarounds. So it was uh, the, the system we had in place was very well organized, not just mission control, but they could uh, dispatch through uh, MER, the MER mission evaluation room, which was an adjacent building actually at Johnson Space Center, who had uh, a lot of people there, including some contractor folks, and furthermore, communication back to the major contractors who really had designed and built the spacecraft. In other words, NASA doesn't build the spacecraft, but a contractor does that in the case of uh, command and service module, that was North American Aviation in Los Angeles, and the lunar module, that was Grumman Corporation in New York. So they had availability to call on that brain trust uh, to help uh, uh, get their opinions or get their inputs on some of these workaround procedures and ways of doing things. So I knew that was in play. It had been in play for every mission. Uh, actually started, I think, during the Gemini program uh, probably it grew uh, more to the point we had it in Apollo. And you had nowhere else to go. You were in that tiny spacecraft with your two crewmates, right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> you mentioned earlier that you lost the chance to, to walk on the moon. You write in the book that Apollo 13 was the first lunar landing mission that prioritized science, although science was done on Apollos 11 and 12. But you guys really took to science and um, were planning to do a lot of a lot of field work on the moon. Could you talk about how much science training went into your mission, especially the geology training? Right. Yeah. What we were fortunate to have was more time. Uh, after uh, Apollo 11, they had started to stretch out the launches, like it launched in July. Uh, 12 launched in uh, November. And we were not going to launch till April of the following year, 1970. So we really, and we went back in training because we were the backup crew on 11. 
So we went into training immediately for 13. So we had literally uh, double the time of previous missions to prepare. And that allowed us to do a lot more of what we call field geology, uh, if you want to call that science, but really to make us good uh, agents to be on the surface. And because, you know, you really didn't have a clear definition of the surface uh, set circumstances uh, from or any orbital pictures we had. So what, what you were going to see was uh, something that had never been seen before when you landed, even though they mapped out a tra what they call a traverse, the path you would follow and sample. The hope was, and, it, and then people did it on missions, being good uh, field geologists, they would observe that that wasn't necessarily the right path and the right uh, things to collect to best uh, describe the local topography and uh, which would help them with the history and, and also the type of material. So that, that was basically what we worked harder on was being good field geologists, uh, not, not the lab type uh, scientists. Uh, so that, that gave us a lot more exercises. We did probably uh, double or even triple, uh, certainly way more, 11, I think only did one. Uh, and I think we did something like 12 uh, field exercises. Following Project Apollo, you worked on the shuttle program pretty extensively and, and flew the first test flights of the Space Shuttle Enterprise, which, which tested the shuttle's landing capabilities, correct? What, what was your involvement with those shuttle flights? Well, the, uh, leading up to the shuttle flights, I had four years in the Orbiter Project Office, so I was really in program management and also heavily involved with the, what NASA does is critique the design as it went along that uh, Rockwell, at that time North American had become Rockwell and develop it, design developing uh, the first shuttle. And uh, we had uh, two crews assigned uh, myself and Gordon Fullerton, one crew, Joe Engel and Dick Truly were the other crew uh, that were to fly the shuttle and the test program that had eight test flights. And I flew uh, eight, uh, five of the eight on the Enterprise. Now, you're right, we, we were going to test uh, several things. The air, uh, verify the flight aerodynamics from what we'd seen in models and wind tunnels. Also, the landing characteristics of the vehicle. Uh, it was a dead stick vehicle, no engines, when we hopped off the 747. Another big, probably the biggest challenge we had uh, was to get the uh, four set uh, computer set to work. Uh, this was the first time, the first fly-by-wire vehicle we had uh, <laughs> built. The, all, all the Apollo vehicles and uh, Gemini and Mercury were all hardwired uh, and, and very, very small computer. We, we went to the moon on one-tenth of a megabyte computer. That's a megabyte, not a gigabyte. That's hand incredible wired, to think about. Hand-wired. And so this was now a big, bigger computers and all uh, mucks, if you will, are uh, fly by wire. You know, in other words, when you move your control stick, it didn't move cables and pulleys to move the surfaces. It sent signals through the computer that then moved the surfaces of the vehicle. So it was a whole different ball game that way. And one of the things we wanted for redundancy was to have four computers that all talked to each other and could do voting logic again against each other for the parameters they were evaluating to vote out a bad computer. If, uh, if it you know miscompared with the others, yeah. and we had a heck of a time getting that to work. And that when testing in the plant, they kept voting each other out, uh, and <laughs> to the point where we we almost gave up on it, and almost said, "Well, we'll go fly it with just one computer in the primary and one computer in the backup." But we finally got it to work with the by the last load before we're going to have to give up that IBM delivered uh, all at once. They were solid as a rock. Uh, but that, that was a, probably the biggest, the software and that computer evolution was probably the biggest challenge to, to, uh, to handle that design, proving it uh, as much as the aerodynamics uh, we did. And these were, these were essentially glider flights where the, the shuttle was the huge glider attached to a 747. You would separate and then you would pilot the, the shuttle enterprise down to a landing uh, through some maneuver through some maneuvers. Yeah, this was definitely not a program to build up <clears throat> to build up a lot of flight time. 
the longest flight I think was <clears throat> something like five minutes and 20 something seconds. Now, the, for the past 15 plus years, you have been on the board of directors of the Infinity Science Center in Purlington, Mississippi, close to your hometown of Biloxi. I always love getting, giving a shout out to fellow science institutions. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the Infinity Science Center? Well, Infinity uh, came about, I guess you'd say, because of 9-11. Uh, there was a small uh, museum at, at uh, Infinity Science, uh, I'm sorry, Stena Space Center <clears throat> at the time. And that's a government facility. That's where the NASA tests their rocket engines. And 9-11 with the uh, severe uh, restrictions on access to government facilities virtually uh, killed the, the attendance at that museum because people could no longer just drive their cars out and go to the museum. NASA tried to stage uh, buses to pick them up at the, at the Mississippi State Welcome Center, which is off the same exit, and that didn't work. So they decided, NASA did, uh, the current the director at that time, the public affairs lady, and the head of the a bank, that was the largest bank in South Mississippi, uh, to, they would need to get something offsite. And NASA deeded our board of directors, which I joined, a not-for-profit board of directors, uh, 18 acres on a 30-year lease agreement, land use agreement. But our challenge was to go raise $40 million to build it. And then, op and then we operate, which we still are. We're operating it. NASA would use it as their visitor center. And of course, we'd, we'd have the attendees, at least in one gallery upstairs. That was a space gallery. would get the same treatment they got at Stenosphere out at uh, Stenosphere Space Center. Although we went into ecology on the Earth Gallery, which covers hurricanes, wetlands, those sorts of things around that involve around the Gulf of Mexico. <clears throat> and so uh, that, that was a big challenge, mainly to raise the money to, uh, to be able to build it, uh, which we, we finally did and uh, opened up in 2012. And of course, we, like all museums around the country, were hit hard with COVID. Uh, attendance uh, went was very nil, and we actually shut down for six months at one point. And uh, but we reopened and regrouped. Uh, we got uh, school field trips back. Uh, for instance, in uh, 2019, before COVID, we had uh, almost 30,000 children uh, on wow. uh, field trips, which is a big number for the Mississippi Gulf Coast, which are all relatively small cities. And uh, but we've, we've got only gotten about halfway back in that accord, uh, but field trips are back uh, this year. Well, that's good to hear. And I look forward to vis visiting the museum. I haven't been there yet, but it's, it's on my list of places to visit. All right, I wanna end with my big three questions. Just give me the first thing that pops into your head. And question number one, I, I read somewhere, I don't know if, it was in your book, I read somewhere that you uh, have flown more than 80 different types of aircraft. Is, is, is that a correct number in the yeah, ballpark? It's, 80, it's 81, I think, if you count models like uh, F-104A or F-104B, F-104D, et cetera. Uh, I don't know if you subdivided it into just one aircraft uh, without the types, it would be less, but. We'll go, we'll go with 81, we'll, okay. yeah. And my, my question is, if you could go back and pilot one more flight, which aircraft would you choose? Well, Did you have ones, a favorite? Uh, the ones I've flown, uh, of course, I'm fa I favor fighters since I was military, I was in fighter squadrons. Uh, the, the, uh, the best fighter I flew was the F-86 Sabre. Uh, now, from, I'm talking about from how it handles, how well it trims, uh, performance, uh, and all, all done without any computing uh, aid. And that, that's the thing. Today, today, if I flew an F-35 or an F-22, I'd probably say it flew nice too. But it's really flying nice because the computer's doing a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, to, make it, to make this airplane that wouldn't fly very nice aerodynamically uh, handle nice for the pilot. So it's kind of a little fakery <laughs> in a way. <laughs> with the modern aircraft, which has been done to enhance its performance and 
whatever. But uh, the, if you look at just the bare airframe aerodynamics of the old vintage without all the fancy stuff, uh, the 86 was uh, the best natural handling the aircraft of the fighters. All right, question number two. Following your Apollo 13 flight, you and your crewmates were invited to a private dinner with President Nixon and the First Lady at the White House. You also spent a couple of days at Camp David. Do you have a favorite memory of being at the White House or Camp David? Well, I think the, the White House uh, was obviously uh, President Nixon and his wife and his immediate staff. And of course, uh, it was just, it was, it was interesting because most of those media, uh, kind of affairs after a flight were big state dinners with maybe 150 people and lots of tables. And uh, this is more like a family gathering. And so it's almost like around the table small talk. And of course, uh, quite shocking to me was what happened later with Watergate. Because it was obviously this, these were people who were very intelligent uh, and uh, I, I would assume knew, knew what they were doing. But uh, that, that was the, uh, the strange aftermath of that, uh, that party, if you will. I bet. All right, my final question. This December 2022 uh, will mark the 50, 50th anniversary of Apollo 17, the last time humans have been on the moon. What year do you think we'll see human foot human footprints again on the lunar surface? Well, obviously NASA has Artemis planned. I don't know the program that well to know what date they've chosen, but based on a little uh, stutter they've had, well, number one, the, the Congress has not exactly, once again, uh, um, provided funding per the program plan. That has, uh, has stalled somewhat and actually called, caused a suit on the first the procurement they did for the landing craft, the lander. Uh, they picked uh, Elon Musk version, and of course, uh, Bezos had an entry and he protested it because they had said they were gonna pick two and they ended up, I think, picking only one, a sole source. Not a sole source, but a single winner, uh, which kind of wasn't what the procurement said. So that anyway, the protests won. And so they got to do another cycle of review, which has probably cost them six months to a year on whatever schedule they predicted originally. Uh, and of course, how, how well it follows any schedule, any program, is uh, how well Congress matches the plans, the, the plan NASA's laid out to follow, how well they're funded per that plan. Uh, you know, if you underfund it, which has happened and happened to me in the book I described, big right. time on space station freedom all you do is generate a lot of paper and you don't get uh hardware we, we could not get behind that the big jump in cost that when you get ready to build something actually build the hardware and they just kept stalling with the funding and so we were almost slipping year for year on space station freedom and uh it's uh, it's wasteful uh, to not have an optimum program plan you follow uh, but i don't think uh, anybody uh, quickly understands in Washington what a program plan is and uh, what it means if you deviate uh, and try to regroup. Uh, it's, uh, it's not as efficient. Well, I hope we go back to the moon uh, soon. I'm a little too young to remember a lot of Apollo, uh, so I'm, I'm really anxious to see us go back to the moon and, and walk on the moon and, and go, to, go there to stay. So I hope it happens. Amen. Yeah. Well, Mr. Hayes, thank you so much for talking with me today. The book is Never Panic Early, an Apollo 13 Astronaut's Journey. Highly recommend it. And thank you again and, and have a great rest of your day. All right. Thank you. Science Headliners has been made possible by the generous donations you make to the Linda Hall Library.